Hungarian folk tales. The discontented cooking pot. The cooking pot was bored with boiling and bubbling all day. So he began to complain to the walking stick. Oh, I can't bear to stay here anymore. I do long to leave this place, replied the walking stick. So let us set out together, my friend. Yes, let's, for the journey is always more pleasant when one has company. The pot and the walking stick set out to see the world. Neither of them was terribly clever. The pot, as of course you know, was empty inside, and the walking stick was hardly famous for his wit. At first, however, things looked promising. For when the pot was almost trampled on the path by the angry bull, the walking stick leapt up and began to whack the bull soundly on its backside. And while the walking stick was walloping the bull, the pot jumped into the river. Swim, swim, shouted the walking stick. I'll catch up with you soon. The walking stick soon grew bored with whacking the bull, so he too jumped into the water. He thumped his nose at the bull, who bellowed from the bank, but was unable to follow him. At the end of the village, the walking stick came across a pack of stray dogs. And when the dogs attacked, the cooking pot shouted, Whack them! Whack them, my friend! And the stick gave the dogs a sound beating. And as they continued on their way, they came across the terrible monster of the mines. The monster of the mines was terrified, for he had never seen a pot and a walking stick out for a stroll all on their own before. Horrors, what a fright! I'll grab my bag and take flight! And the monster of the mines fled and took shelter in the hollows of the cliff. And as he ran so quickly, he failed to notice that there was a hole in his bag and glittering gold coins were falling on the ground. But the pot and the walking stick noticed. Come, come, let's gather them up. The walking stick neither dillied nor dallied. He gathered up the coins and put them into the pot. The pot was brimming with gold. No one would have dared to call him empty-headed anymore. How fortunate we've been, they said to each other. And they began to weave the most elaborate plans, visions of wealth and grandeur for their future together. The pot thought to himself, I shall find someone who will wrap me in wire and make me immortal. They will cover me with wire, strong wire, all over, that I may never crack or break. And once I have ensured my immortality, I will ensure myself a life of leisure and comfort. I will bribe the cook to make sure I am always brimming over with stuffed cabbage. For the pot simply adored stuffed cabbage. Then the walking stick's vanity also rose to the fore. From now on, I will be a great lord. And after I have split the riches with my friend, I will find a skilled blacksmith and have a golden button made for my head. But then again, he thought after a moment, if I had all the gold we found to myself, I wouldn't have to content myself with a mere button. I could have my entire head covered in gold. Heavens, it would be simply splendid. I would be the most beautiful walking stick in the country. Maybe even the king would notice. Perhaps he would even want me to be his scepter. And why should I not have all the gold? For am I not the stronger one? His head was teeming with cruel and murderous thoughts. And when the pot lay down his head to sleep at night, the walking stick snuck over to his side and delivered him a single lethal whack. And thus the pot's good fortune turned out to be deadly misfortune. The poor pot shattered fragments, clattered, clacked and cried out, Murderer! Murderer! But the walking stick barely noticed his cries. 
and he stuffed the golden coins in a sack and set off to find a blacksmith. God's blessings on you, good blacksmith. What have you bought me, honourable walking stick? A sack full of golden coins, blacksmith. Where did you get that, you rascal? I found it by the side of the road, said the walking stick, feigning a look of innocence. And what do you plan to do with all that money? You are but a mere walking stick. Good blacksmith, make me a golden knob for my head. The blacksmith took the golden coins, melted them, shaped them into a lovely knob, and soldered it on to the walking stick's head. There you are, he said to the walking stick. You may now set out to find yourself a wife. But his golden head, itself the fruit of his cruel act, would bring him no joy, only misfortune. His path took him deep into the forest, and Black Jack, the infamous bandit, spotted him. And the brigand spoke, the knob on that walking stick is made of gold, if I am not mistaken. Look, Matty, how shiny it is. Let's chase him down, grab him and take his golden knob. Stop, stop, they cried. But naturally the walking stick did not stop, but ran from the bandits. He was gasping for breath when he reached the top of the high hill and the bandits were still hot behind him. At the bottom of the tremendous chasm gaping below him flowed the waters of the mighty river. The walking stick had little choice but to jump into the waters below. He tried to summon his courage. I am, after all, a walking stick. I can swim. I am made of wood. I will reach the far bank. I am, after all, a walking stick. I can swim. I am made of wood. I will reach the far bank. And so he jumped into the waters. But lo, soon the waves were splashing over his head. He sank to the bottom, never again to rise to the surface. For the golden knob, the spoils of a cruel misdeed, pulled him into the depths, down, 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 to a watery grave. Hungarian Folk Tales Fisherman John By the banks of a mighty river stood a fisherman's hut and in that hut a fisherman lived together with his wife but alas they had no children. One moonlit night, the old man went down to the river and he cast his net. Suddenly he saw something approaching on the waters and it shined like a star. He watched as it neared him. And what did it turn out to be? A small coffin. And in the coffin, lay an infant child, fast asleep. He lifted the coffin from the waters, placed it in his boat, and took it home to his wife. Look what I caught in the river! And lo, he showed her the beautiful golden-haired child. We have no children of our own, he said. We are old, we will raise him, and then we will have someone to care for us. The old woman agreed. Time passed and the child began to go to school. The school teacher had a scrawny little horse. He said to John, for that was the boy's name, Little John, tell your father he could buy this horse. So John ran home full of excitement and told his father. Father, my school teacher has a horse for sale. Let's buy it. We don't need a horse, son. We have neither hay nor oats. How would we feed it? The boy said, it could graze in the woods by the banks of the river. 
So they bought the scrawny horse, and the horse grazed in the woods by the banks of the river. One day, the horse spoke. Listen, John, at the edge of the village there is a small house. In it, a worn saddle. Ask the owner to sell it. If he won't sell it, steal it. The owner gave John the saddle, for he had no need of it. And little John took it home and put it on the horse's back. Then the horse said, Go, John, to the edge of the village. There is an old bridle bit. Buy it, and if the owner will not sell it, steal it. But the owner would not sell the bit, so John stole it. Again the horse spoke, John, go to the village. There is an officer there who has a rusty sword, and if he will not give it to you, steal it. The soldier gave John the sword and told him, Polish it until it shines. Be a soldier. John returned home, and again the horse spoke. Master Fisherman John, tell your father to buy you new clothes. The old man said, Son, I cannot buy you new clothes, for I have no money. But John insisted and told his father that he would pay for the clothes. So his father agreed and bought him new clothes. Again the horse spoke, My dear John, polish the harness, the bit and the sword, then clean the saddle and put it on my back. He continued, My dear Master John, you have a younger sister whom we shall bring back. John, however, insisted that he had no sister, the horse said. Yes, you do, at the edge of the neighbouring country. She is locked away and only rarely sees the sunlight. Climb on my back and we shall set off. They went to the edge of the neighbouring country and found the house where the girl was locked away. There the horse spoke. John, kick the door three times. If it doesn't open, strike it with your sword three times. If it still doesn't open, look around to see if you can see anything. And if you do see something, jump on my back. I see an old woman, said John. At that, the horse took off at a gallop, racing along as fast as thought. When they reached the banks of the river, the old woman appeared behind them on a long stick, carrying a broom in her hand. And when the horse jumped to the far bank of the river, the old woman struck the surface of the water with such force that the waters parted. She cried out, Lucky for you that you got away. Then the old woman went back. The horse said to John, My dear Master Fisherman John, we will set off again tomorrow, but you must be very careful. The next day they set off again for the house at the edge of the neighbouring country. John kicked the door, then struck it so hard with the sword that it burst open. He grabbed the girl's arm, but he tore her blouse and was unable to pull her out. Again the old woman appeared on the stick with the broom in her hand. John said to his horse, The old woman is coming! and the horse raced homeward as fast as the winds of a storm. When he reached the river, he jumped to the far bank. The old woman lashed out at him with the broom and struck the horse's rump, but the horse was still able to leap to the far bank. The old woman cried out, If you ever return, I will have all of your teeth. The next day the horse said to John, Fisherman John, we won't go today, but tomorrow we shall. Today we must rest. Then he said, Dear Master, there is a tree in your father's garden with three apples on it. Pick them, put them in your pocket, and when we arrive at the house at the edge of the neighbouring country, throw one of them at the top of the door, one at the bottom of the door, and one at the middle of the door, but throw them so hard that you break the door down. So John did as he was told, and when they arrived at the house, he threw the apples at the top, the bottom, and the middle of the door, and the door broke down. The girl, Helen, stood in the doorway. John led her outside, and when they had left the house, John looked to see if he could see the old woman, and indeed, there she sat on her stick with her broom in her hand. John said to his horse, Oh, the old woman is coming, on a stick, carrying a broom in her hand. So John and Helen quickly mounted the horse, and the old woman chased them. Fisherman John, look behind us, because I feel that my rump is on fire. Johnny looked back and saw a cloud of dust far behind them. The horse flew onward, and when they reached the bank of the river, the old woman was still behind them, accompanied by 27 magic stallions. John's horse jumped to the far bank. The old woman and the 27 stallions tried to jump the river too, but they fell into its waters and drowned. And today they still lie somewhere beneath the waters of the river, if no one has fished them out. 
And so John rescued his sister Helen from captivity, and they both lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Miraculous Bird Once upon a time, in a distant land, where the curly-tailed pig digs at the soil with its snout, there lived a penniless man. He was so poor that his daily meal consisted of nothing more than the things he was able to gather together in the woods and the meadows. Once when he was trying to catch a bird for his lunch, he caught a very beautiful crow. The bird was as black as night, yet its feathers shone like the stars. The man took the crow home, and his children were delighted. They put it in a cage, and kept it, and cared for it. The crow grew and grew, and eventually it became so tame that it ate from their hands, and hopped about the room. One day a wanderer passed by. He looked at the bird, took it in his hands, and happened to look under its wings. Underneath its left wing was written that whoever ate of the bird's liver would become a king. Under its right wing was written that whoever ate of its heart would find three gold coins underneath his pillow every day. Now, who doesn't want to be a king? So the wanderer resolved not to rest until it had eaten the bird's liver. The poor man also saw the writing, but he did not know how to read. So he asked the wanderer what it said. Alas, nothing good, he said. This bird will die in two days. It would be better to kill it now. I happen to like the taste of crow. So if you roast it, I will give you 1,000 gold coins for the meat. So the wanderer placed the money on the table. The poor man regretted having to kill the poor animal, but he was in dire need of money. He didn't think much about it, but simply slayed the bird and roasted its meat. As the meat of the bird was roasting, the poor man left the kitchen for a moment. The children were playing around, and as they were hungry, they snatched the heart and the liver from the pan. When they placed the meat of the crow in front of the wanderer, surely enough, he could find neither the heart nor the liver. He was furious. Hey, you wretched man, where is its heart? Where is its liver? But neither heart nor liver were to be found. Well, not having found the heart, the wanderer realized that he would never become king. He jumped up, not having eaten a single bite, and left. The poor man despaired. He regretted all the money he had lost. So he told his sons that they should vanish from his sight and not return until they had gotten all the money back. How the two sons worried, but what could they have done? They set out to find the 1,000 pieces of gold.
They ambled and rambled with heavy hearts, until around sunset they arrived at the edge of a large forest. There they spent the night. When they awoke the next morning, a soldier was happening by. He gave them directions to the town, and the two boys set off. The king, it turned out, had very recently died. When they arrived in the town, they saw a beautiful golden bench. The older boy sat down on it, and the younger lay down underneath it. And they both immediately fell asleep. The next day they awoke to the sounds of a large crowd of people who had gathered around them and were cheering them enthusiastically. The people took the two boys to the palace. The one who had eaten the crow's liver was immediately chosen as king. As it so happens, according to the customs of the town, anyone who didn't know that the old king had died and sat down on the golden bench would be chosen as the new king. They had had a total of seven kings, each of whom had been chosen according to this custom. So this is how the older boy became king, and never again did either boy have cares or worries, for the older boy ruled as king, and the younger boy found three gold coins under his pillow every morning. Their father, in the meantime, deeply regretted having chased his sons away, so he set out to find them. By the time he reached the town, he had become so poor that he was forced to beg. He made his way to the palace, and the king immediately recognised him, and he ran to his younger brother. The younger son was also delighted, and they both embraced their father. Of course they were not angry with him, but they were a little ashamed that he looked so dishevelled. They took him to a cobbler and a tailor and had beautiful clothes and boots made for him. And they let him stay with them at their new palace. And together they lived happily ever after.